How much will Gaza's health crisis cost Palestinians and the world? Now lacking even basic health care infrastructure, disease and infections are running rampant, with health workers predicting an epidemic of deformities and cancer to come. Can the region and the world afford to have millions of victims continue to suffer decades into the future? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Gaza's health crisis. With Israel about to ban the only large aid agency functioning in Gaza, things could go from terrible to catastrophic for Palestinians who are barely surviving from day to day. While aid workers try to address the immediate threats, few have time to consider the looming long-term consequences of Gaza's destruction. Rubble from thousands of flattened buildings is riddled with deadly heavy metals and asbestos. The water supply, if it works, is dangerously polluted. What's left of agricultural land is now contaminated with white phosphorus and depleted uranium. And once the war is over, the full rebuilding of Gaza could take a century. And in that time, health experts say there will be a full-blown epidemic of disease, child deformities, and cancer. Here's a look now at the near and long-term health effects of this war. Israel's decision to ban the UN's Palestinian refugee agency, UNRWA, threatens to reshape the humanitarian landscape in Gaza. For millions, UNRWA provides medical care, education and basic needs, a lifeline now under threat. UNICEF has warned that Gaza's children face even greater risks with UNRWA's forced exit. But Israel argues the agency colludes with Hamas, claiming the need to counter Hamas's influence. UNRWA's departure isn't a mere bureaucratic shuffle, it risks a cascading crisis. More than two million people in Gaza depend on it. The US, UK and other countries have voiced outrage at Israel's decision. They really play an irreplaceable role right now in Gaza, where they are on the front lines getting humanitarian assistance to uh, the people they need it. There's nobody that can replace them right now in the middle of the crisis. So, we continue to urge the government of Israel to uh, pause the implementation of this legislation. We urge them not to pass it uh, at all. The ban comes amid warnings from Gaza's health sector about mounting hazards. The destruction of buildings and debris has introduced dangerous levels of asbestos and heavy metals into the environment. Compounding the issue, Gaza's water infrastructure lies in near total disrepair and as immunization programs stall, risks from preventable diseases are on the rise. If UNRWA is unable to operate, uh, it would likely see the collapse of the humanitarian system in Gaza. UNICEF um, would become effectively unable to distribute life-saving supplies. Here I'm talking vaccines, I'm talking winter clothes, I'm talking hygiene kits, health kits, water, water and sanitation, RUTF on malnutrition, and we know, again, we're knocking on the door of famine, an all range of, of nutrition supplies. So a decision such as this suddenly means that a new way has been found um, to kill children. Yet Israel's position remains firm. Knesset passed the ban by an overwhelming margin, with claims that UNRWA harbors individuals with ties to Hamas. These are not aid workers. These are savages who have seized UNRWA Gaza and transformed it into a Hamas chapter. These heinous criminal scandals can no longer be swept under the rug, no longer ignored. This council, the international community, and the entire UN must accept the reality that UNRWA Gaza is beyond redemption, beyond saving, beyond reform. We must turn a new page now. For the people of Gaza, Israel's decision represents more than a policy shift. It's a question of survival in increasingly desperate circumstances. So can Gaza's health crisis be addressed effectively? And if not, what will be the long-term consequences? Joining me now to discuss that and more are from Bethlehem, scientist, ecologist, and director of the Palestine Museum of Natural History, Mazin Kunseye, from Hong Kong, spokesperson for the World Health Organization, Dr. Margaret Harris, and from London, director of Doctors of the World or Médecins du Monde, Simon Taylor. 
Thanks all so much for being with me. Let's first address, if we can, the banning of, of UNRWA. Uh, Dr. Harris, you know, you've said Gaza's hospitals are the most grim thing you've ever seen in your long career in public health and, and with the United Nations. So, I mean, could there be any legitimate ground to banish the largest aid organization working in Gaza, given how dire the situation is right now? No, there is not. Uh, in fact, Israel, as the occupying power, is obliged to ensure that the people have access, full access to humanitarian services and their basic rights, which is health care, which is food, which is clean water. And the only way you're going to deliver that effectively is through an organization with lots and lots of experienced people on the ground, like UNRWA. There is no alternative to them. Uh, we're already struggling just to get the aid in. But without the people to deliver them, you've just destroyed any hope of improving the situation when it mm -hmm. is, as, a, as you quite rightly said, at its most dire. We've been hearing that, Dr. Harris, for quite some time, though. So, I, I mean, give us a better idea of the depths of how bad it can really get, because it has been on this downward trajectory for the last year since the war started. But even before that, it was in terrible shape. So, so what is the end game? So really, if you just leave two million people with no services, you are condemning them to death. Uh, we've already seen massive losses, 45,000 we know of dead. Um, we know uh, but tens of thousands under the rubble, lots and lots of people that have not been accounted for. We've got over 100,000 people injury, injured, at least one in four of them with life-changing injuries. In other words, they are, will never be the people they were before they had those injuries. Uh, and no means of helping them. All. There was, before this conflict began, rehabilitation services. We had a limb con reconstruction service uh, because there were problems already, as you know, much conflict. Many, many people were injured by um, the various explosives. Uh, but now none of those things exist. In, in fact, 39 rehabilitation experts have been killed. <laughs> and, and, you know, that's just a small number of the huge numbers of health workers that have been killed. Mm. So you've got continuing destruction. Uh, you've got huge increasing needs and, you, and continuing reduction of the ability to meet them. Yeah, Simon, you don't dispute that analysis. But let me ask you this. If, if you could, you know, parachute into Gaza with exactly what you need to address the most pressing health and sanitation issues right now, what would you have to do? Well, uh, there's a question for you. I think in the first instance, um, I, I have to acknowledge the teams who are working there because we have to remember that the people actually who are conducting these operations are victims themselves. They are undergoing the same stresses and dramas and traumas that everybody else is going through. Uh, our staff teams and my, my fellow INGO staff teams and UNRWA staff teams are exposed to the same harsh environments, relenting environments, that the people they serve are under. It, it's just not sustainable. I mean, I would, in an ideal world, you would you would love to see a greater access um, and, and, and being able to refresh those teams, keep people on board. I mean, really, I I struggle when I when I hear the messages from the field, especially from our field teams, they are undergoing so much at the moment. And and it's going to break soon. And with this on this recent news of UNRWA. Uh, the future is, is just even worse. But I would, I would really love to enable greater access, especially really to give people a break, to give the field team space to actually perform the duties they're doing. They're under so much stress and pressure at the moment. And what kind of support, it's not even support, I mean, what basic supplies do they even have? If there really is no clean water from what we're hearing, you can't get the medicines in that are needed. And I mean, the, the, so they're going to be, are they getting sick as well? I mean, is this that, how are, what are their defenses? No, you're, you're exactly right. And I think as well to, to rehabilitate that type of infrastructure, those are the core items which are regularly blocked. You know, the pipe work, the fuel, the, the, the materials required just to rehabilitate some of the basic infrastructure, the water and sanitation methods, um, facilities, they are blocked. Uh, medicines, we've seen four cargo trucks in a year coming just for our organization. It's ridiculous. 
And of course, what you're seeing now is you're seeing people who who would have a very small minor ailment that could be treated within a few days becomes a protracted illness, becomes something right. that takes months to heal. And it just becomes a, a pressure upon a pressure. It right. becomes ridiculous that, it, you know, we we just can't even solve the basics. And people who are going chronic uh, illnesses are now no longer receiving the medications that they were receiving before. Let's make no mistake, it wasn't particularly good before yeah. uh, October last year. And now, obviously, it's it's tenfold worse. And Simon, I'm going to stick even, with you. Oh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, because to even think about the future at the moment is it's a really difficult question to answer, but, uh, especially when thinking how, how to rehabilitate a country. Uh, and that was part of what I was going to answer, because, I mean, what does it mean then to have the looming threat of a future epidemic of, of cancer and disabilities if you can't even get basic treatment for the people who are suffering immediately? It's a catastrophe. If it isn't a catastrophe already, it's one waiting to happen even worse. Like I say, I mean, I reiterated that the teams are not prepared anymore to, to take any more. Um, when we're seeing a reduction in the INGO space with colleagues being restricted and cargo being restricted, it just gets worse and worse. So I, I don't know how we could address this. I mean, we're stretched, everybody's stretched. And of course, we're undergoing the daily pressures of, of having to... How can I say? We're also undergoing the same uh, intimidation and threats that um, that the people of Gaza are going under. They're all under the same the same banner, the same stresses. Okay, uh, Mazim, let me come to you because you are on the ground in the region. No one has that magic parachute I referred to. So tell us more about the people who are there that you've spoken to on the ground, addressing the needs of the people suffering, and how much danger everyone is in collectively. Uh, thank you for having this show and for discussing this very important subject. Uh, what we see on the ground in Gaza, and you know, I talk to people in Gaza all the time. I'm situated in Bethlehem, of course, in the West Bank, but that's only a mere 50 kilometers away from Gaza. And the people in Gaza, which you are observing in your own uh, uh, videos here that you can see, are struggling to even find food to eat, let alone health care. Health care was decimated in Gaza. Every hospital was either shut down or limited in its capacity or bombed to smithereens. Uh, North Gaza is the worst, of course. In North Gaza, Israel wants the whole population out. So they started there, and now they are ending there, if you want. They are removing all um, medical personnel from North Gaza. They are pushing people to leave North Gaza. They are arresting and detaining medical personnel. They have over 100 medical personnel from North Gaza alone that have been kidnapped by the Israeli army. That's not to mention the medical personnel who themselves were killed or injured, and that's close to 10% of medical personnel in North Gaza. And the others who were forced down south include another 30 or 40% of medical personnel in North Gaza. So North Gaza is left without uh, medical services, without civil services, without firefighters, without any kind of uh, semblance of care. Uh, right. Also, the supplies are limited, of course, and not allowed in. So that's another, it's, it's a method of ethnic cleansing to deny people medical services and force them to flee. That's a method of ethnic cleansing. It has been used before successfully, and that's why Israel targets all basic services, medical services, food services, water services, anything that keeps life going in those areas are targeted, and you end so, up with a genocide, a holocaust in the and, making. And meanwhile, I mean, especially with the banning of UNRWA, Israel is saying that they're banning UNRWA because there are Hamas operatives uh, working among them. So what are you up against as, as Palestinians in trying to fight for basic aid workers coming in if the theory for Israel is that 
all of these aid organizations are somehow going to have Hamas operatives in their ranks? Well, colonial powers historically have always said that the natives' resistance are terrorists and uh, are barbarians attacking us for no obvious reasons. But putting this aside, of course, the colonial powers can use propaganda to justify genocide. And the propaganda is there's a Hamas fighter behind every civilian in Gaza. There's a Hamas fighter in the hospitals, in the universities. That's why all the universities are demolished in Gaza. This is propaganda that any rational human being with access to even limited data or even a few videos can show that this is false and not true. For example, the universities were occupied and then blown up. Mm. If you occupy the university or the hospital and then blow it up, explain to me what does that mean about people that are resisting Hamas okay. or otherwise that are fight that are within those universities. Why would you need to demolish them after you occupy them? Understood. Okay, Margaret, let me come back to you because, uh, you know, on the ground as, as doctors and aid workers, I imagine people are working on adrenaline right now. They are in full survival mode. So what happens when the urgency, when and if, I should say, the urgency passes and they're faced with the reality that almost everything around them has been eliminated? This is, I find it quite extraordinary that people are still going on and, and we've just heard how hard it is because we've got health workers now who've been working 24-7 for 12 months under the most impossible conditions and they've actually already faced that situation where they've seen entire hospitals destroyed and one of the things that I find most remarkable is they keep on going and rebuilding. So, for instance, Al Shifa Hospital, which was just flattened, destroyed, everything looted, all the equipment broken and just ruined, has actually been to an extent, I mean, it's not back where it was, but it's up and running and doing nine to no, at least nine to ten operations a day and has become the most important hospital north of the Wadi Gaza. Mm. Uh, and, and so the resilience is extraordinary. But I think, as my colleague said, you cannot demand that resilience of people. You know, we all owe it to those health workers to do everything we can to relieve them and bring in as much help as possible. But this is not being made possible at the moment. Right. So, Simon, you know, Gaza was already one of the most densely populated areas on Earth. Uh, it was described as an open-air prison by the United Nations. And when this destruction of livable space, you know, is realized, thinking of how densely it was already populated and now how much livable space has been eliminated, how are survivors physically fitting in and how are they going to fit in what livable, and I'm putting it in quotes, livable space is there when this is over? That's a, it's a, a great question. I think, I think it's one that the, um, the humanitarian and the, the health community are experiencing on a daily basis with all of these movements having to rebuild a clinic. And these are just not necessarily destruction, but also through having to relocate themselves. So actually having to also live in that space, every, what, three or four times now, uh, a clinic has had to be rebuilt in, in a brand new place after being forced, the forced displacements that are going on. There's also adding additional stresses and tensions. But I mean, the population in these numbers with, with limited uh, water, um, water and sanitation and hygiene facilities, it really does have a disaster looming. It, you know, the worst case scenario could be on us that poor health facilities, a population is such a densely crowded population, no infrastructure. I mean, it really, it doesn't, it doesn't look good. And we do need to ensure that we can support the health workers as best we can. I mean, the only way is just by getting better access. Uh, it's something we're all striving for all the time. Right. I'm going backwards a little bit, Simon, because, you know, with so much of the destruction of these physical buildings and infrastructure, um, we talked about the, the health hazards being created by just that physical dust. 
all the people that are living around, are we looking in, in health terms of kind of what was created after 9-11, but on a much more massive scale? Because it's not just two buildings that have come down, it's almost, it's an entire city, basically the equivalent, that has been pulverized, and now people are left to constantly breathe that. I mean, you, you're not wrong, but you can add tenfold to that, mm. because of course the lack of support, the lack of any sort of health care, any sort of uh, assistance that's ongoing, the poor nutrition and hygiene, people's resilience uh, to, to disease and illness is, is at rock bottom at the moment. And putting this on top of it, I would only suggest this is, this is far worse than was ever seen uh, in the past. Uh, and of course, the proximity of people to each other only makes things worse. And there's nowhere to go. And this is the big thing. There is nowhere to go. Then really says the next step will be another displacement, another forced displacement. And this has to, this can't carry on. And Mazin, you estimate that if it's repairable, it will take 200 to 300 years, you've said, to have Gaza, func have Gaza functioning like it was before 2006. So, I mean, psychologically, will Gaza just become a breeding ground then for completely desperate people that could lash out even worse at the oppression that they're suffering? Well, the United Nations itself says if Gaza is opened up, uh, you know, opened up more than it was, of course, before this onslaught of 2023, 20, because it was under blockade for decades. But if the blockade is lifted, it would take 70 years for Gaza to rebuild to the pre-2023 uh, uh, situation. And that was not a good situation, by the way, but it would take 70 years to do that. The 200 to 300 years that I cited in one of my papers is about uh, potentially repairing things like the water aquifer, which would take that long to reclaim the water aquifer because it has been so badly damaged, or the soil that has been so badly polluted with things like depleted uranium and white phosphorus and other munitions that Israel has used. So the healthcare situation, of course, and cancer rates we know will increase like they did in Iraq after the Iraq war. Mm. So we know that this can be devastating long-term effects on the health of the population. But as Simon said, and Margaret also, the situation that's more immediate is that literally people are dying as we speak, uh, and not just from the injuries and the sh killings, injuries that they don't have treatments to because the healthcare system is totally collapsed, at least in North Gaza, uh, but also from diseases, uh, common diseases like hepatitis, like intestinal disorders, like skin disorders that are spreading. According to the World Health Organization, some 900,000 Palestinians in Gaza suffer from diseases directly related to the denial of basic right. care, basic sewage, basic water, clean water even. Yeah. There's no clean water. Uh, Dr. Harris, I'll just finish with you because we asked at the top of the program how much will Gaza, Gaza's health crisis really cost the world? And you brought up, you know, Israel as an occupying power will have to meet its obligations to address people's needs here. Do you ever see that happening? And ultimately, who's paying the price for this disaster? I think each and every one of us, but of course it's the innocents, the children of Gaza, who are paying the highest price. They have not had food from birth. Their mothers, 96% of the pregnant women in um, Gaza currently, are malnourished. So they are bringing into the world babies who've not had anything like the start they should have had. And of course, they're, they're being born in impossible circumstances. They're exposed to dirty water and uh, a, a, an environment that's so degraded with the dust, the asbestos. But I think every one of us should recognise we have to pay the price that we, for, for letting this happen. And we have to somehow change what this thinking that, that somehow it's OK to keep doing this for political reasons. It is not OK. And it degrades every one of us by allowing it to happen day after day.
Simon, quick final words. I'd like to give you the last 30 seconds. Go ahead. I was just going to echo exactly what my colleague said. This is a catastrophic humanitarian disaster brought on by uh, political uh, differences. And really, it's a political problem that needs to be solved. Uh, the people are suffering, the innocent people are suffering because of this, and it's it's been created by these memes. I think we should all... We're, I'm just tired of listening to voices now. I'm tired of listening to comments. It really is getting very hard for us. I'm not even on the ground, but my colleagues are, and, and I look at my colleagues on, online. Um, we feel this dearly, and it's, it's, it's too late for words now. We need more than words now, and we keep okay. hearing them, and I would love to see someone actually stand up and say enough's enough and treat this seriously and actually follow through with some of the some of the, the condemnation right. of what's happening. Simon, that will have to be the final word. Unfortunately, we're completely out of time for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank all three of my panelists so much for being with us and our viewers, of course, for joining us as well. Remember, you can follow us on X and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey, and we'll see you next time.